We've been treating neuropathy for many, many years, usually with medication management. And, but there's some patients out there that do not respond well to medications. And I had a patient the other day who unfortunately did not. What else can we offer this patient? So unfortunately, neuropathy has been in a very long-standing condition. It's, been, it's one of those chronic disorders or illnesses that are very challenging to treat. So historically, we've been able to treat neuropathy with certain types of medications. Now, neuropathy itself is, is uh, burning, numbness, tingling in the extremities. So the hands or feet that um, get super sensitive to light touch, uh, they have a chronic or constant burning, throbbing sensation. They may even have some achiness with it. Uh, and it can come from different types of uh, uh, medical conditions. So uh, the most common form of neuropathy usually comes from diabetes. So longstanding diabetes mm, yeah. can give you something called diabetic painful neuropathy. Uh, you can also get neuropathy after chemotherapy, um, sometimes radiation therapy, and then we have um, small fiber neuropathy, um, and then we have you know what we call idiopathic neuropathy, which really just means we're not sure what the cause is, but it's it is neuropathy or it's a type of nerve pain condition. So for patients who have had long-standing neuropathy, we usually start treatment with medications, and those medications could be uh, agabapentin duloxetine or Cymbalta, pregabalin or Lyrica are probably the most three most common medications that we would go to as first or second line treatments for chronic neuropathy. If those don't work, and unfortunately lots of times those don't work, historically we would then say, okay, well, you know, we can um, potentially put you on an opioid of some sort to try to dull the pain and give you some better quality of life. There are a couple of different opioids that have some nerve pain um, treatment properties to them, 
But at the end of the day, you know, if we can avoid narcotics or opioids, we'd want to do that. And I'm happy to say that recently the FDA has approved spinal cord stimulation to treat uh, painful diabetic neuropathy. And this is something that we've been doing in our practice for years. Uh, it's been getting more challenging because the insurances have become more uh, specific and particular about the diagnosis for which we can use spinal cord stimulation. But you've seen those patients who um, have responded to STEM and they not only have um, life altering changes, but they're also sometimes able to be on less pain medications yes. and they get better quality of sleep. They get, they're able to function better and their, you know, their quality of life really improves. Well, with this spinal cord stimulator, how long is the recovery? Well, it's a two-step process. So the stimulator itself is a trial, and if you get 50% improvement with the trial, that's just not only pain relief, but functionality, then we go to a permanent implant stage. So I equate the stimulators to pacemakers, because most people are familiar with pacemakers. They're about this big, they usually get implanted underneath the skin, and that's what the stimulator is like. But instead of doing any, affecting the heart, what it does is it blocks pain from going to the brain. So the FDA has approved spinal cord stimulation for uh, treatment of diabetic neuropathy pain. And we would start with a trial. And the trial itself is done through a needle or two. And we place el electrodes with electrical contacts on them through the needle into the epidural space. And that procedure takes maybe 15 or 20 minutes to do. It's done under x-ray guidance in our office setting or a surgery center. And we tape the wires in place. And that we leave in place for about three to five days, sometimes even a week, uh, and we see how much relief people get. So there's no uh, incisions involved, there's no sutures involved, it's just a lot of tape that secures the wires in place. It is using a needle that we've used for other types of injections or spine-related procedures that we've done on, on, on most of our patients who've had different types of injections in the past. So pe most people are familiar with that part of it. It is a fairly quick procedure and the nice thing about it is the patient then gets to test drive this treatment to see if it can help. And after three, five, or seven days, they come back into the office, we take the tape off, we slide the wires out, and then we ask them how much better they felt. So if I think I'm a good candidate for this, can you take me through the process from how do I get diagnosed to how do I get a recommendation to have this and then what takes to move forward with this? Sure. So the first part would be to come in and be seen by a physician or a provider, uh, whether that's in our practice or your primary care doctor's office or your neurologist's office or your endocrinologist. Uh, we're really looking for someone to evaluate and make that decision on whether or not this is the condition that is the problem. So if you have a diagnosis of neuropathy, well then right off the bat, this is an option for you. However, if, if what I'm describing sounds like these are the symptoms that you may be having, then it's probably best for you to see a provider to get evaluated and to get an assessment to see if neuropathy is in the differential of what you could potentially have. An EMG nerve conduction study test is a test, a needle test that can uh, help us identify if you have the diagnosis, but it's not always necessary to make that diagnosis. So it means that we don't necessarily have to have an EMG or nerve conduction test to be diagnosed with neuropathy, we can make that diagnosis uh, by basing um, through clinical uh, an overview of by, by well, we can make that diagnosis for neuropathy based on your history and what you're what you're describing and how it feels. So once you get the diagnosis, then you come in, we, you talk to us, then we can start the authorization process if you've exhausted the conservative treatments, which would be the medications. So if the medications haven't helped, then the next step is to get an authorization, which we'd have to submit the paperwork to the insurance. That could take anywhere from a week to a month to get approval. Then we get you scheduled, which, which um, can get scheduling pretty quickly. Uh, the trial itself is about 20 minutes long. The procedure itself is 20 minutes long. And then we bring you back in about three, five, or seven days later to have the, the wires removed. If you respond to the trial, then we send you to a surgeon to get evaluated for the permanent implant. And that permanent implant surgical procedure is an outpatient procedure. You go home the same day. It usually takes a surgeon about 45 minutes to an hour to implant the device. And they'll see you back two weeks later for a post-operative visit. And then you'll continue to see us and we will help manage the device. 
which w may need some reprogramming, which doesn't hurt. It's all done through Bluetooth technology and uh, the reprogramming itself is painless and can help keep the devices updated. Well, I would say we've been doing pain management for a long time and I think that we've seen a lot of patients who have benefited very well by this. Um, on a personal level, you, you know that uh, I've had a couple family members and friends that have gone through this and have successfully had a uh, stimulator you know, implanted and still doing well. So I think that one of the key components is having the patients really, really understand that this is not just a one and done, you know, this is this treatment in addition to is not so much in lieu of. So therefore, it's not like you're going to be done and then we're going to just turn our back on you. You're still going to be our patient. There's, they still see us on a regular basis. And in fact, you saw one just the other day. And how many times did she tell you that her quality of life is just, she's 70 years old and can get on the floor with her grandbaby, can get up. Yep. That's profound. And, and I think part of the issue is that people don't know that this even exists or they may be worried about whether or not they're a good candidate for it or if, if they're too old or if they're too sick or if they're too young to warrant talking about this. So I would say it's very easy for us to discuss this. Um, go out to find your providers, discuss this with your providers because this could be something that can be life altering. So in 2015, I started having pain in my low back and the pain will go down my legs. And then it turned into numbness and tingling in my lower legs and feet. And we came to realize that part of the issue was diabetic peripheral neuropathy. My name is Farrah Stewart Tarver and I live in Spring, Texas, a suburb, suburb of Houston with my husband, kids, and I am a nurse by trade, a pediatric nurse. So the pain got to be where I would say it was a 10 of 10. I stopped working at several points. I was home in bed most of the time, sitting on a heating pad, pretty much feeling depressed because I felt like I worked so hard for my career and there were things with my children that I was not able to do. I went to see numerous providers. I've done physical therapy, taken medication. I've had um, steroid injections, nerve blocks. You know, they really felt like they couldn't figure out what to do to help. So they said, well, maybe you should see Dr. Patel. She's an interventional neurologist. You know, maybe if you see her, there's something that she can do to help you. So what I told her is that you know, Farah, since you have optimized your oral medications, you've done your physical therapy, you've tried the creams, and you're still in a good amount of chronic pain here, and you're having this painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy, why don't we take the next step for spinal cord stimulation? So we took her to the surgery center, we did a spinal cord stimulator trial. She had a successful trial, which is great, because it's like test driving a surgery without committing to the surgery. Do you feel? After the trial, Farah did elect to undergo that surgery with me so within a week or two she was back to doing her normal walking uh, up and down stairs groceries all of those things I can go on walks I mean that's that in itself is a big deal because I hadn't been able to like get up and go to the park and go for a walk so you know I can do that with my daughter now and just do different things with my kids that I had been unable to do for years we love to travel. We travel. We try to travel frequently. I had to stop doing that for a while unless it was absolutely necessary. And now I've been able to go to, um, I've gone to Vegas twice since I've had the simulator. We went to Hawaii, which was an eight hour flight. So my outlook um, improved dramatically on you know the future because now in my head, I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe I won't have to be in a wheelchair in 10 years when I'm in my early 50s. For me to be able to see someone like Pharaoh who came to me almost really depressed, not knowing what her future would hold, reach a point of her life where she's so happy, so active, and really hopeful about the future, this is why I do what I do.